Morning, everybody. Very warm welcome to Community Sunday here at Grace. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's praise that God who so loves this world. Let's stand together. Please do stay see, stood, if you would, for a moment, and we'll, we'll pray, nearly. <laughs> we'll pray uh, as we continue this morning. Father God, thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you, God, for the freedom and the opportunity to meet like this. Thank you that we can meet together. Thank you that we can celebrate the work of volunteers from this church in our community. Thank you that we can sing and pray and learn from the Bible together. As that song said, to, to come and behold that wondrous mystery that is your transforming love for us. Lord, we don't take any of these things for granted. And we ask that you'd be with us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Please do take a seat. My name's Graham. Uh, Welcome to Grace Community Church. Welcome to Community Sunday. Uh, You will have been given some information on the way in about the life of the church. Uh, Plenty of things going on for you to learn about, find out about, uh, get involved with, sign up to. Uh, Do take a moment to look at the back for the diary uh, dates for that. Uh, You will uh, have opportunity if you have children with you. Uh, to make use of our children's groups. We have uh, Bible Tots for up to three years old and then Bible Explorers from three years old to school year one. And there'll be a moment in the service where I'll give you a nod for you to be able to uh, take them out a little bit later on. But this is Community Sunday, an opportunity for us to hear about some of the community projects in Bedford and Kempston that uh, this church are involved with, connected to, linked with. Uh, that we have volunteers uh, running uh, throughout the week. Uh, the church is not just a Sunday thing. It's something that we are involved with uh, throughout the week in our uh, community. Uh, after the service today, uh, well, after the second service today, uh, we'll have a picnic in the park at 1 p.m., Uh, just out here uh, in the Addison Park. If you're able to join us, grab some food, make a dash between this service and one o'clock, grab a sandwich, grab some apples and just come and sit with us. There'll be plenty of food if you haven't got your own anyway. So please do come and uh, join us for a picnic in the park this afternoon. Speaking of food, uh, kids, when you go to the the supermarket, you maybe help your mum and dad put the things in the shopping trolley. You walk it through the checkout, you pay. And then sometimes when you get to the end, you see a big cardboard box that has the words food bank put on it. Have you ever seen the food bank boxes at the supermarket? And maybe you've put something in there. Uh, Food bank is one of the things that this church helps to run in our community. Uh, Food bank is basically for for people who, who are struggling to have food that week. Uh, people who have donated food, that food gets given to people who don't have enough food. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, that we get to be involved with. I wondered if you could uh, help me, children especially, uh, figure out some of the, uh, the, the amount of food that gets given away by our food bank uh, each week, each month, each year. So here's the first question for you, multiple choice questions this morning. Uh, how many families do you think are fed per week at food bank children hands up who how many families do you think are fed is it is it two families per week is it 12 families per week or is it 20 families per week mm, hands up go on lydia what do you think is it 20 it is 20 families per week are fed by our little food bank run out of project 229 in, in kempston okay next question uh, how many people In one year, does our Grace Food Bank feed? Is it 90? Is it 190? Or is it 900? How many people in one year? Go on, Gracie. 190, did you say? Is it 190? Let's find out. That would be a lot. You said 900. Oh, my goodness. I think Gracie might be right. It's 900 people per year are fed by the Grace Food Bank. Isn't that fantastic? Okay, final question. How many tons of food have been given away in Bedford so far this year? Okay, not just the whole year, but so far. It's June, we've had six months. How many tons of food do we think have been given away? Now, if you're struggling to think, what's a ton? What on earth is going on? A ton? A ton is like the size of a rhino, okay? So how many rhinos of food... Do you think have been given away in the last six months? Is it five rhinos of food? That would be a lot of rhinos. Is it 10 rhinos of food, which is also a lot of rhinos? Or is it 15 tons, 15 rhinos of food? You might have noticed a trend down here. Go on. It is 15 tons, 15 rhinos of food have been given out in Bedford this year. And look, there's some of that food right now in the food bank crates getting ready to be distributed to those who need it. So a huge thank you to any of you boys and girls, any of you mums and dads and grown-ups who do donate a pack of food at your supermarkets, which will go into those food bank crates and be given to those who need it the most. Uh, Please know that it's never just a tin of beans or just a pack of pasta. It is a life-transforming lifeline to those who need it. So thank you so much. 
Let's hear now from someone for whom uh, Food Bank has been a bit of a, a lifeline. We're going to hear various stories this morning from people who have uh, volunteered and accessed some of the community projects that Grace Community Church runs. And for this gentleman on screen now, uh, Food Bank has been one of those things, as well as other projects in and around our community. So let's, uh, let's sit back and enjoy Matt's story. So two years ago, I would have been uh, jobless, um, no connection with friends, no connection with family, um, in total isolation. Um, debts absolutely mounting up um, and I was at the point where I could see no hope, no future. Um, it was a very, very dark place, very dark and lonely place. All the feelings were of um, guilt, shame, and a const just in constant fear, constant fear of um, the doorbell, constant fear of post, because I knew it was always be bad news, phone calls, if I ever answered the phone, it would always be bad news, somebody chasing me for something. Um, everything was just black. It was just a, a horribly dark place to be. So I'd, I'd been in and out of um, drug and alcohol services for about 10 years. Never really ready to accept that I had a, a proper problem. I was put in touch with a, an organisation called Community Led Initiatives and there was a lady in there. She didn't judge me, she didn't blame me, she sowed the scene of going to rehab, which I never thought was an option for me, could never afford it <clears throat> with all the debts I had. But one of the conditions of me going into rehab was that I had some sort of financial stability. Um, my finances were a complete shambles. All my utilities, my mortgage, everything was, I was in massive debt. And somebody told me about this organization called CAP. And I arranged to have a meeting with the lady. Um, she explained what it was all about. Um, Christians Against Poverty. Within a matter of months, they, they put me onto such an even keel um, that the people that were willing to fund me to go into treatment uh, were happy for me to progress. And that was, that was solely down to CAP's help. If they hadn't have helped me get into to that situation, um, then I wouldn't have got the funding. Um, so that they were pivotal, absolutely um, crucial to me getting funding. And the help and support I've got from them has just been huge. Um, and I'm getting ongoing support now. On the back of that, they introduced me to the food bank um, because I was struggling for money and food, etc. I never thought I'd be in the position where I would need a food bank. I got a voucher and I remember turning up the first day and I actually didn't go in the first day because I was too embarrassed. The following week, I got another voucher and I actually, I remember, I do remember, I got there extra early um, to try and get there before anybody else would come. And the lady actually, I can't remember which lady it was, but I remember she opened up early and she let me in early. And they were just so welcoming. Um, I felt guilty at take, I didn't feel like I deserved it. Um, and I felt really guilty, especially when I was offered extra extra little treats that, that they had. When I came out of, of treatment, I um, still had a anxiety and I was still unsure about myself. Um, and it took time to start mixing in the community. Having the opportunity to help out at the food bank was a massive help. One, I was very welcomed and two, it gave me the opportunity to interact with other people and I could, ex I could understand and, and speak to them about my experience of coming into the food bank to try and put them at ease. And on the back of that, I've now um, 
been able to offer my services with CLI um, as a volunteer um, and giving a little bit back. Uh, Matt is here this morning, uh, along with Jonathan, who we'll be hearing a little bit more from uh, later on. I know they'll be delighted to share some more of their stories, because a lot more you could have said even in that, that few minutes, wasn't there, Matt? Uh, Matt, there's a picture of him there, uh, serving uh, at Food Bank. Uh, if you've got that on the screen, there's a, uh, Matt was someone who needed Food Bank uh, to serving Food Bank. Uh, there he is with the, some of our other Food Bank uh, volunteers, and uh, we were serving together on Friday afternoon, weren't we? And boy, we needed you that morning. It was busy, wasn't it, that afternoon? Uh, so please do find Matt and Jonathan uh, after the service. Matt did text me saying he wanted to say, he didn't get a chance to say it, he wanted to say how grateful he and thankful he was to the people who he's met along the way and who have helped and continue to support him on his journey of recovery. Uh, we'll hear uh, more stories like that uh, throughout this morning, as well as the volunteers who have been involved with these projects. But for now, let's stand with the band and sing our next song. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. Our pain is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. Seats, if you can. So uh, Grace Community Church, along as, as part of the community things that we run, we run various children's and youth groups uh, throughout the week. 
uh, around, uh, around uh, Bedford, uh, well, around Kempston, uh, particularly here in the Addison Centre. And you can speak to my colleague uh, Tamar about any of those things uh, after the service if you want to. Uh, these are some of the various things going on. There's playtime and dad time, which are toddler groups, uh, our tic tacs and chaos groups for children, right up to our youth groups. Uh, which are called Havoc, and there's various things going on throughout the week and on Sundays for them. Uh, Caleb, uh, Kezia, and Bethany, come and uh, just stand nice and close here. You are, uh, you're going to lead us in prayer in just a moment. Thank you for that. But let me just ask you a little bit about our uh, children's clubs that you, uh, you go to, children's and youth groups. Uh, Kezia, first of all, uh, Kez, tell us about uh, Tic Tacs. What do you do at Tic Tacs? We do games, stories, crafts, crafts quizzes. And Bible verses. Very good, fun. Uh, Caleb, you're going from Tic Tacs into chaos in September. Take a step forward and tell us, uh, how are you feeling about that? What are you looking forward to going into the new group in September? Um, I'm looking forward to making other friends um, in upper years. And something that really grabbed me when I went for my first time on Friday was that they had all that chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Chocolate. Uh, and, and Bethany, um, you, you are, uh, you're in the Havoc group, so you're uh, in the youth group now. Uh, tell us what is Havoc, what happens at Havoc? Yeah, so it's lots of teenagers getting together, playing games, um, having fun and learning more about God through the Bible. Uh, and it's not quite as Havoc as the name implies, but the leaders might feel a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> But now you also volunteer at the Tic Tacs group yeah. and various other kids groups. Tell us about the, the team. Tell us what it's like to volunteer for the children's group. Yeah, so I really enjoy it. Um, I think you, it's really good to see the kids having fun and engaged in the talks. Um, and it definitely makes you appreciate other, what other people do in their teams as well. Great, thank you. Uh, like I said, if you want to find out more about the various kids and youth groups going on, uh, Tamar's around, there's these information flyers uh, on the information table on your way out uh, as well. Uh, we're going to sing again in a few moments, but first of all, uh, Bethany, Caleb and Kez are going to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Father God, we give you thanks today for all the opportunities we have as a church to bless and support the community of Kempston. Thank you for all the volunteers who sacrificially give their time and energy to show your love to the world in a practical way. Thank you, God, for all the children and, in, and in youth groups that happen in the week. Please help the t team leaders in everything they do. And please help those who are moving up to new groups in September. The Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world and that we are to be like him wherever we are. God, please help us all to live our lives in a way that serves you by serving the people who live around us. Lord, we ask that over the coming months and years, more and more people's lives might be touched and changed through the work of this church and the charities it connects with. We especially ask that you would be close to those in our community who are going through really difficult, dark times and that you'd show your light and love to those who need to know there is hope in your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Jesus is the light of the world and uh, we are to be like him. Thanks, Kez, for that reminder as you prayed. We're going to sing of that light of the world that we long to see shining ever brighter, don't we, in this dark world. Let's stand together. Beauty. 
You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am. So here I am to worship, and here I am to bow down, and here I am to stay there. You're my God. You're all together. Please take your seats. I'd like to invite Ruth up, uh, who's going to read our Bible this morning. It'll be the Bible passage that Ray will be speaking from a little bit later on. Uh, It'll be in your your meeting guides, uh, so you can follow along uh, in a church Bible and on the screen. But before Ruth uh, reads the Bible, uh, Ruth, come and join me because you, uh, we have a a couple of uh, support groups, one for men, one for women, uh, that run throughout the week. The men's one is called The Shed. Uh, the women's one is called The Net. It's a so- social support, peer-to-peer uh, chance for people to connect and make friendships and build bridges within the community. And uh, Ruth, you volunteer uh, for various things, but one of the things you volunteer for, and a little bit more, is, uh, is The Net. Uh, tell us, what, who, what is The Net? Who is it for? Uh, what is it like? So as Graham says, The Net is a support group for people families in Kempston who have become isolated for whatever reason and there's loads and loads of different reasons that this happens to people. Um, We have two meetings, uh, one on Wednesday, one on a Thursday. We get alongside these people, befriend them, find out a little bit about them and and see how we can help them in their journey getting back into normal life and feeling more confident. Part of that journey for people is to connect with various Mm -hmm. projects, multiple kind of touch points with the projects that we run in the community. Uh, Tell us about how that works and uh, and how that tends to work well. It does work well. We've looked at the food bank already. Now, there's been many people who have come to food bank who we have thought, hmm, we can help them a little more. So we've referred them onto the net and onto the shed, which is the uh, man's group that's already been mentioned. Um, Once we have somebody in our group, we can then think about all the other things we can offer them. If they've got children, they can join in the children's stuff that's already been um, mentioned to us. CAP as well, which has always already been mentioned, we can refer them there. Um, there's lots of other things that's gone out my mind at the minute. Like the Well Woman Workshop. The Well Woman and... Workshop is another thing that many of our net ladies do, which is a real, real benefit to them to build up their self-confidence, their self-worth, and help them to get back into normal life. Have you got a particularly encouraging story of someone who you've connected with over the last year or so? Over the last year or so, yes. There's always encouraging stories because for some reason, that the amount of time I've worked with the net, they're always brilliant the the people who come in there's volunteers and then there's a group of ladies they always support each other it's just a wonderful atmosphere they make friends with each other but there is one particular lady when i was thinking this lady had mental health issues could not leave her house could not get out of her front door for a very long time she was referred to us and she came intermittently to start with but as she found acceptance and found it was an easy place to be a relaxing place to be she came more and more And it was a shame during COVID because obviously that set her back a bit. But now she's got herself a job. So not only can she get out the front door, she's now got a little job and started to work, which is just such an encouragement. It's such a privilege to, you know, see people on those journeys. Real privilege. Great news. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, Ruth, would you read the Bible for us? Thank you very much. I will indeed. So today's reading, I think Graham's already said, is from Mark 14. Starting at verse 1, Jesus anointed at Bethany. Now, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While Jesus was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? That could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. 
Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them at any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear he would do this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, and Ray will be coming to speak to us from that passage in just a few moments' time. Uh, let's now hear another story of another gentleman who's had his life uh, touched, moved, changed by some of the things that happen in our community. Let's hear Jonathan's story now. For me, it was about seven years ago that my life really started falling apart. Um, my, I relapsed with my drug addiction and it cost me my wife, my, my home and all my family, um, which then ended up me being homeless for three years and living in a tent, um, which through that whole time, absolutely hated it. life, couldn't see the point in anything. I tried to commit suicide a few times. Um, I was very, very emotional. I hated life. Um, you couldn't, you just couldn't see any way forward. You couldn't understand why my family wouldn't talk to me. Just absolute despair, to be honest, and very, very lonely, very, very dark. And the only way I could deal with that was by using again, which was the reason I was in that situation. So you just feel like you feel like you're fighting a, a losing battle, and you just don't really know where to look, where to go, and it's, it's a horrible feeling. I remember being in my tent one morning and the park warden of the park I was in came and found me and he reported me to some homeless um, charity that then came out and saw me and got me some help. They got me in touch with um, CAP, which helped me with my debts. Um, and then via cab, I then met people like uh, my friend David, who took me on an explore course, like with you guys. And yeah, it's, it's just blossomed from there, really. So, cab came to my home to see me because it was during lockdown. Um, and they, they could see I really needed help with my finances because it was disgraceful. They, they've gone through all my debts and all my, my finances and everything. They've got me to a place now where I'm absolutely debt free and I, I'm, I can survive on the money that I'm getting, which is lovely. I mean, I'd gone to church as a kid, but it was never really my sort of thing because I was always forced to go. Um, always believed there was something out there, but didn't know what. And then Dave got me to come to the Explore course and I remember sort of listening to the, the, the questions being asked and it didn't matter what was asked and no one was judged or or anything like that and it was really, I found it really helpful. And I remember on the second session of the course we'd been talking about the crucifix and how it bridges the gap from the sins that way but also the sins up and down as well and I went home and I was thinking about it and I remember sort of like just sitting there and it resonated with me. I don't know why, but it just sort of resonated. And um, I opened the Bible and it fell open at this chapter about um, punishment and saving and, and stuff. And it just, I remember sitting there and the weight lifted off my shoulders because I opened myself to believing and knowing that I wasn't too far gone. And that was an amazing feeling. The feeling's still there. like. I mean, there's days where things come up and it'd be very easy to question my faith or my beliefs and, and everything. And I'd, I'd sit there and I'd pray on it. And for some reason, I, I just find that it calms me and I don't want to revert to my old life habits. By getting involved with the church and 
just the little bits that they do, like the picnics and the get-togethers and the courses. It's yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. It's such a lovely group of people that are so genuine. You know, no one wants anything from you. Which in the drug and alcohol world, that's all people want. To be honest, like every day is just it's a blessing to get up and and just be going. To be honest, and not having that addiction hanging over you and the debts hanging over you. It's it's, it's such a freeing way of living and it's, it's, yeah. And again, we're very grateful for Jonathan uh, sharing your story. If you want to speak to him afterwards, he's here to chat with after tea and coffee. Uh, anyone else? <laughs> uh, uh, he mentioned uh, that the, um, one of the things we talk about in that Explore course is how the cross is the only bridge between us, people who have done stuff wrong and thought stuff wrong and said stuff wrong and a perfect God who desires relationship with us. And the cross is the only way that that gap is bridged. Uh, and Ray will be coming to speak more about Jesus who died on that cross uh, in a few moments' time. But shall we just pray? Uh, and then uh, we'll sing a couple of songs together. Let's, let's pray. Father God, thank you uh, for Jesus. Thank you that he did bridge that gap between us and you, the God who loves us and made us and desires relationship with us, desires us to be transformed by your love. And that love comes through the cross and nowhere else, not by our own efforts, not by us just getting our acts together and becoming better people, but by your first step towards us through Jesus dying on the cross. Thank you so much for that truth. Thank you that, as, as Jonathan mentioned at the end there, even though we sometimes have doubts and fears and sometimes disbeliefs, Lord, we know that those things can be put to rest through prayer and through focusing on who we are in you, that there is nothing that can take away from the fact that you died for us to save us and to love us. And so as we sing about those things in a few moments' time, let those truths sink deep into our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In a few moments' time, Ray will come to speak to us. If you do have children, uh, you want to make the most of Bible Tots for up to threes, Bible Explorers for up to school year one, then these songs are the time to do that. Let's stand as the band leaders.
soul and of its peace, the merits of your great high priest have bought your liberty. Rely on now on his precious blood, don't fear your banishment from God.
Eat it. Please turn, if you have a Bible with you, to that passage on page 1019 or in the middle of the meeting guide. Ask this question. What does the word countdown mean to you? Well, those of you of a certain age who've got leisure on your side will go, it's that game in the afternoon where the clock goes, dun, 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 and you've got it or you haven't. That's countdown. Uh, for me, I guess when I was growing up, countdown was watching those fantastic Saturn V rockets. Three, two, one, blast off and off they go up to the moon. You've seen Apollo 13. You feel something of the power of a countdown. What about this one? Seven, six, five, four, three, two. That's where we are. We're on two. One, death and hell. That's the countdown. Three, two, one, death and hell. That's what Jesus is facing as we read the opening bit. Now the Passover and the festival bread were only two days away. He's going to go to the cross. In fact, in Matthew's There are four accounts of the life of Jesus. And in Matthew's account, in this parallel, he says, and Jesus said to them, I'm going to be crucified and buried and then mysteriously rise from the dead. But that's the countdown clock that's going on here. We're at two. Tomorrow is his last full day. Then it's what we call Good Friday. That's death and hell for Jesus. And we're at two. And what's happening at two on the countdown clock? Well, some people, some people then and and now would would want to rid the world of Jesus. They literally, you see the top religious leaders, uh, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. They want to rid the world of Jesus. Now, there are people still today who would say, like, Jesus has been, you know, he's not done us any good as a human race. There was a whole load of books in the early noughties, 2000, 2004, 2005, 6, written what were by called the New Atheists. Angry men who's like, Christianity is a blight on the human race. It would be a criminal fence, if we could make it so, for adults to teach children about Jesus. Now, most people aren't like that. Most people politely just airbrush Jesus out of their lives. He doesn't matter. If you've been brought up in Western Europe just these last few years, it's been hard for you. If you'd asked any European for 1,600 years, who is the most important person who's ever lived on the planet? There would have been a chorus from hundreds of millions of people. It was Jesus. Everybody knows that. The most important person that's ever lived is Jesus. But these last 50 years, Jesus has been airbrushed out. He's no longer in our school curriculums as he once was. Our politicians don't quote him as they once did. If you were in an educated, posh company, it would be an embarrassment if you said, well, why don't we have it? Can we discuss the life and impact of of Jesus of Nazareth? You'd have a big circle of people move out some people may be even angry frustrated that you how dare you bring him into the conversation Jesus has been has been taken so for most ordinary people now growing up well, you know I don't know we met a lady in Bedford a while back she would have been in her early 40s I guess what do you think of the death of Jesus was the question and she said oh I suppose he died of old age didn't he and that was our culture Jesus has just been Pushed to one side. Despite being the one that has shaped world culture more than any other human being. I think that's a historically demonstrable point of view. that It would stand academic rigor. But Jesus is airbrushed out. Jesus has been, don't bring him into the conversation. Some people perhaps still like that. They want to rid the world. They want people to know about him. He's irrelevant. He's mythological. He's made up. Huh, he's religious. That, that's, and it's hard if, you've been, if that's the oxygen you've breathed to think that Jesus might be really important. In fact, the one person you really need to know about, it, it's hard. Like, am I a bit of a nutcase if I want to find out about Jesus? Well, the answer throughout the whole of the rest of human history would be no. But today, you're made to feel a bit weird 
if you want to find out about Jesus. Now, you're not up there to murder Jesus like they were. But just to keep Jesus out as they did. They would rather have him not be here. They want to rid the world of Jesus. Some people are like that. Some people miss the point entirely. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it, broke it, poured it on his head, and we're told elsewhere on his feet, and you know, and so on. She, and some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. They rebuked her harshly. Some people saw what was going on, but they didn't know what was going on. For them, they just saw this woman, and she used this perfume on Jesus, and they were... Now, on the surface of it, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, I suppose they could have... Uh... They're right. They could have sold that perfume, and, and that money could have helped needy people. What is she doing? But you just got to step back for a moment. What is she doing? Look, she's not gone down to Harrods and brought the most expensive bottle of Chanel, whatever number it is, poured it on herself, walked into the room to make every other woman in the room look pathetic and every man be allured. That's not what she's done, is it? She's not used the perfume on herself. She's used it on Jesus. And when they say, what a waste, they're also basically saying, Jesus, you're not worth it. <laughs> she, she's poured this perfume on you. Well, what a waste that is. Now, now think about it again. It's, it's perfume. They said, oh, you could have sold it. Well, somebody somewhere is going to use this perfume. It's perfume. It, it's not cash in the bank, is it? They, they see it as just merely cash. And they said, well, that money... Could be used. Well, well, somebody one day is going to use that perfume. And then the kind of perfume it is, is once it's cracked open, you've got to use it. And she says, Jesus, you are worth it. And they think, no, you're not. <laughs> Deep down, when they say a waste, it's a waste because it's been spent on Jesus himself. And they kind of look very moralistic, don't they? Like, could have been used for the poor. Notice a couple of things in the passage. They're saying indignantly to one another just gives you an insight into their emotional set they're not broken hearted for needy poor people so much as cross that something's happening they don't like that the little phrase there they're saying indignantly it's like the snorting of a horse <gasps> you know kids you ever oh, don't tell me now but do, mom and dad ever do, <gasps> it's that kind of feeling it's it's not a kind of oh, i don't get what she's doing what's she doing i don't know what's she doing they're all cross indignant <gasps> And they're saying to one another, rather superior, don't you think? She's coming, expressing her love for Jesus. And they, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's happening. They're cross and they rebuke her harshly. I, I don't know if they've ever been told off. It's never nice being told. But rebuked harshly? Notice what Jesus says. Leave her alone. Why are you bothering that? You're missing the point. When Jesus says, the poor you always will have with you, you can help them anytime you want. That is not a cynic. Oh, there's always poor people. Yeah, you can always spend your money on them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not like that at all. What Jesus is saying is this. She under understands the countdown clock and you, die, you guys don't. He quotes a passage from the Bible. If you've got a Bible, don't worry if you haven't, but if you've got one, you can turn with me. To Deuteronomy chapter 15. You can see what he's quoting. And this is what Jesus is quoting. Verse 7 of Deuteronomy 15. It's page 194. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites. In any of the towns of the land. The Lord your God has given you. Do not be hard hearted or tight fisted towards them. Rather be open handed. And freely lend them whatever they need. And then it goes on to say. Give generously to them. Do so without a grudging heart. Because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor in people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. When Jesus is always going to be poor, he's not saying, oh, you know, phew, they're always there, you know, these sponges. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is you will have plenty of opportunity to show your love for others. 
But just right now, you don't get the countdown clock, do you? She does. They are missing the point entirely. In fact, in the very next session, it's the next day. It's one. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? We always do Passover. It's this year's Passover. Where do you want us to go and eat the Passover? Like just normal life going. They have no idea that it's one. They haven't heard the clock going down. Despite Jesus telling them, despite that sense, they miss it entirely. The sad thing is, they're Jesus' disciples. The, the other Gospels, Matthew and John, who report this incident, they're much more honest, I'm not honest, or candid. They're more direct. They say, it was the disciples. It wasn't just, it was us. Regular followers of Jesus who were missing the point entirely. It's quite a challenge to us, isn't it? Can you be a follower of Jesus and miss the point entirely? The countdown clock is happening and you just no awareness of it. Just life is just going on. Another week's gone. Another year's gone. Another, another day. It's, it's perilously easy to be a follower of Jesus and not know what's going on. Now what God has given us to help us. To stop every day being just like the next day and the next day and the next day. He right at the very beginning and now has given us a one in seven pattern. There's one day every seven that God says, remember that day. Remember when I made the world, but more especially use that day to remember when I'm coming back to fix it. The first day of the week, this day, this Sunday is God's gift to his followers to say, keep it special. It will keep you aware of the click, the tick, clicking talk. Ticking clock. Cool. That was odd. Um, you'll remember. Because if you don't, every day will merge into another day and you will miss. Whereas this day reminds you, the Lord was crucified on a Friday. He was buried on in Saturday, but on Sunday he rose again. And that is God's great testimony to the world. He's coming back. And it's much sooner there now than it once was. This is the day when we've set our hearts on, yes, I'm heaven bound. Heaven is my home. And when I remember that regularly, I live my life differently. Our musicians lead us in a song and we all sing together. But you live life with two songs going on in your brain all the time. You've ever, have you ever had two songs happening at the same time? Maybe you've got, you know, a, a Viennese waltz. Da, 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 da. And then on the other hand, you've got, she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's those two songs and you kind of, I, I'm, I'm dancing a little bit as if I'm to the Beatles, but I'm trying also to do it. When you've got two songs in your head at the same time, which beat are you dancing to? Which beat? And it's so hard, isn't it? Because it's noisy and it's so tempting. That's the world in which you live. There is a dance, a beat, a song going on that says, live yourself, enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. There's another song saying, you're heaven bound, you're heaven bound, you're heaven bound. Which dance are you dancing? Which is the beat that's dominant? It's so hard. So Jesus said, look, once in every seven, push it out. Just hear heaven's song. Gather together, fix your eyes. So then when you go into the everyday weekday heavens on your heart and the values you live by the beat's still there you're still dancing to heaven's tunes you're still following Jesus as Lord now the trouble is what happens now is that our culture has made this day like every other day the sun comes up it's a new day dawning and nobody much around you is singing heaven's tune and, and the things that are offered to make this day like every other, they're not evil things. They're just good things that can take the best away from you. So you have to fight as a Christian now for this heaven's day. We have to fight for it. We can't, it there'll be loads of things that will fill it. All the stuff you can do on a Saturday, you can now do on a Sunday easily. And those things you can do on a Saturday, good things, lovely things. Especially when your kids want them. And they're not wrong. But you have to fight, otherwise the tune will never resonate in your head strongly enough to get you through the week. These guys, totally clueless about the time. 
Let's not be the same. Let's not miss the point. We're a, another week closer to heaven. You are another week closer to seeing Jesus face to face. And don't you want to see him? And don't you want to hear his words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. I've been waiting for this time. Come here, let me give you a hug. Can that be? Well, why not? And there's a third person, of course, is the, the woman. She gets the time. She understands. Notice what Jesus says. She has done a beautiful thing. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. They've missed the, the clock completely. She knows there's two days to go. Just two days. And then they're going to take my Lord. And they're going to nail him to a cross. But she understands what that means too. Notice the little phrase. It was Passover. It's the Passover. And then they go in the very next section. To sacrifice the Passover lamb. What's going on? What's Passover? Well it goes back a long time. To when people were slaves. And God was going to come down and judge evil. God is going to deal with evil. And people who've done evil. And God is going to put evil out. Including those who've done evil. And they thought, well, what, what's going to happen to me? I've done, I've done evil. What's going to happen to me? And God says, but I've got a rescue plan. And here's the rescue plan. Kill a lamb. Put its blood on the door. Of where you live. And when the judgment comes. When I see the blood. I'll pass over you. That's, that's the phrase. I pass over you. Judgment won't come to you. Because judgment has already come. The blood on the doorpost said. A lamb has died. Judgment has already come. There's no more judgment needed. Now it's a picture. It's just a picture. Until the day. When a man called John the Baptist pointed at Jesus of Nazareth and said, here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the one that's going to die on a cross, bearing the full judgment of God against evil, the evil that you've done. And when God sees that you're trusting in Jesus, he will pass over you. And she knows that next section when they go, where are we going to eat the Passover? She knows, wrong question, Jesus is the Passover lamb. We're not going to have any more lambs because he is the one that's going to die for my sins on that cross. And Jesus goes on to say, doesn't he? This is my body broken for you. This is my blood. I am the Passover lamb. Trust me. And she does. And as she sees him on that evening, she just can't get her head around it. You are willing to go to hell in my place. You love me so much that you'll take the full consequences of the evil I've done. It's just unimaginable love. And I just, what can I do? I just, I want to show you that I appreciate that. I recognize that. I understand that. I trust that. And I love that. I'll anoint your body for burial. I, I, what else can I do? She shows devotional love to Jesus because she has the opportunity. She will never have the opportunity again. On Friday, he's nailed to the cross. Then he's put in the tomb and that's it. Her time will have gone. But she understands the countdown clock and has the opportunity to show her love for Jesus. That's who she is. Now, question, what are you like? Which one are you? Well, look at how the passage notes ends. Verse 10. Judas... Seeing all of this, sides with the people that want to get rid of Jesus. You can be in a meeting. You can hear all about this stuff. And in your heart of hearts go, no, thank you. I do not want Jesus in my life. And if you've got that thought in your head right now, cry out to Jesus. As much as you can, summon it with you. Say, Please, Jesus, don't let me be like that. Jesus, if I'm, if I'm tempted to keep you out, I cry to you, please come and help me. Help me of all people in this room this morning. Come and bring me your 
forgiveness and love and help. I need it more than anybody else does. You really do. If you're tempted to be like, no, I don't want him. Judas-like. Cry, cry. Right in your heart now. And if you're like those disciples who just don't get it. That your love has grown cold and you're just into the routine and, the, and it's a bit of a rigmarole. And you just, oh yeah, I, I suppose, I suppose. Cry out, Lord Jesus, touch my heart again. Bring me back to the cross. Like you brought that woman. She understood the cross. Bring me to the cross. And help me see again my sin upon his shoulders. Help me to see it. Help me to feel it. Help me to understand it, that you are my Passover lamb. God's judgment has passed over me now. I am free forever. Bring me back to the joy of that. And then I can't anoint your body. But I can show my love for you by being generous to the people around me who need your grace. I can be generous with whatever I have. The poor you will always have with you. I can now show my love for Jesus by being Kind and generous to people around me. That's why the church does it. It's an aspect of our love for Jesus. Come to the cross. And let that refuel your devotion. As it fueled her devotion. Let's perhaps take a moment in quiet just to consider our own reflections. Pray, pray in our own hearts. Father God, we do all cry out to you and thank you for that rescue plan. We cast our minds to Calvary, to that cross where Jesus bled and died for us. And we see his wounds, his hands and his feet. And we see our saviour on that cursed tree, that cross where everything was paid for, where that gap was bridged. Father, thank you that so many of us can praise your name because we can say he's my saviour. Uh, Father, may there be those right now who in their hearts may ask for him to be our personal saviour too. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Let's stand and sing those words with the band. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my saviour on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah's seal and all the
you can stick around for tea and coffee, please do. We'll have a, a picnic in the park as well. Uh, anyone that you've seen on the screen or on the platform uh, would be delighted to speak to you about anything that you've heard about today. Uh, some of the community team project leaders are still at the back at the moment. Uh, please do find them. If, if one of the projects mentioned is something that you or someone you know would benefit from using yourself, or perhaps you have some time that you'd like to volunteer uh, into those projects in our community, please do find any of those who have been involved this morning. Uh, and if you'd like to find out more about the Explore course, the Explore sessions that Jonathan mentioned in his video, chances to ask bigger questions about some of the things that Ray has been talking about, bigger questions about life and faith and death and Christianity, all that sort of stuff, uh, then come and find me. I'd be delighted to tell you more about that. Uh, before we have tea and coffee, uh, let's pray together as I, we close our meeting. Let's pray. Thank you, Father uh, God, for all we've heard and shared together this morning. Uh, thank you for the stories of transformed lives. Thank you that they represent the stories of many transformed lives, many efforts of volunteers across our community. Uh, thank you ultimately for that life-transforming truth that you so loved the world, that you gave your only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not die, but have eternal life. Amen.